Today, this morning, uh, we are going to uh, talk about WSO2's overall direction. We have a number of announcements that we want to make that introduce a changes to our product portfolio, our services offerings, and the way that we do business with each of you, and we're excited to unveil these things here. But all of this is in the context of integration being hot again. And you know, we titled this talk, Integration is Sexy, and we wanted to explore some of the elements around what is causing this dynamic to play out. Hasman is correct, I am new to WSO2. Uh, I've been around the company since 2010, but in my career I spent about uh, 10, 10 or 12 years doing product management in and around middleware and DevOps. And over the past number of years I've been doing investments in, in leading companies in the DevOps space. And I've been on the board of WSO2 since 2011 and it was a real honor and privilege when the founders Sanjeeva and Paul uh, asked me to become its CEO about 10 months ago. And for many of you who have returned, uh, this is the first time that you get to meet me and I get to meet you. And for those of you who are new to the company, welcome. Uh, we appreciate you being here. Uh, but I'm an equal balance between a passionate advocate for the technology and a passionate advocate for the business. And so I like to talk about myself as being care uh, passionate about both the bits and the sense. Uh, this is particularly uh, an exciting event for us. Uh, this is the 14th WSO2Con. Uh, we hold three of them around the world in different territories, and this year we'll have more than 1,000 people attend these events around the world. Um, this is partly due to our overall expansion. We're just under 600 employees around the world right now, and on top of that, we've been opening offices at a pretty good clip, and you can see the offices that we have or the office presence that we have in the upper right corner there. So, what's going on in the industry? This is a quote from Massimo. He's a well-regarded Gartner analyst. And he basically came out and said that integration is suddenly the hottest and coolest thing in IT. And what's interesting is that integration has always been here, but it hasn't been the focus. It hasn't been the attention to quite recently. What's going on? Furthermore, Gartner has said that in 2020, half of all development for your digital transformation projects is going to be tied to integration. And this is a substantial increase in the amount of effort and resources that organizations are putting into integration. And we've come to this conclusion that all software development at some point in time is going to become some form of integration. What are the underlying drivers? What's going on? Well, let's take a look at two particular elements, data and scaling. Now, in the data case, we have this massive drive to adopt artificial intelligence through machine learning algorithms. Machine learning is a way where we can derive extreme recommendations for our customers and use that as a competitive advantage in the software that we built. The richness of those recommendations is directly correlated to the richness of the data that we can pull together, and integration is the backbone on which we use to create these data stores that power our machine learning uh, algorithms. One of our customers, HCA, a healthcare provider, uses API management with back-end integration to create data stores to power their machine learning algorithms on the back-end. And so this is such a drive towards artificial intelligence that we're seeing a strong pull for integration technologies across a variety of different organizations. Another dynamic at play is just the raw scale at what's going on in the industry. Now, if you look back over five decades, we started off with mainframe systems or small enterprise apps that had a very well understood number of connections that needed to be maintained. But as time, has come on, uh, uh, as time has evolved, the demand, the cust consumer demand for those applications has dramatically increased so that in order to scale those applications, our IT departments have had to start to disaggregate their architectures in such a way where individual components become individually scalable. And we've seen this with the evolution of the API economy and a lot of organizations that have become API-driven 
But now as microservices and serverless come online, the number of components that we have has dramatically increased to the point where we're now tracking towards a trillion programmable endpoints. And so these components offer a lot of independent development, independent deployment, but at some point in time, you have to integrate them together. They won't work together unless you integrate them. And so integration has steadily become the glue that is binding all these services together. And so even though we don't talk about it as such, integration is the unspoken challenge of our cybersecurity, cloud, artificial intelligence future. It is the glue that binds us all together. And that is why this market has turned into a $34 billion market. It's a massive market. It's one of the largest in all of enterprise software. There is a tremendous amount of investment that goes into these technologies each year on an ongoing basis. Now, what's interesting is that the press give attention to the knowledge worker, citizen integrator, and the departmental integration iPaaS markets. That's where all the attention goes to, but it's a relatively small chunk of the market overall, and it's increasingly becoming commoditized. It's less than 5%. And most of the money, most of the efforts go into what we call app integration and data integration to power digitally driven organizations. And these organizations are those that are following Mark Andreessen's hypothesis, which is software is eating the world. And if software is eating the world, at some point in time, all of our core competencies is going to be software development. It doesn't matter whether we're manufacturing, healthcare, financial services, insurance, we are all going to use software development as our core competency. And if software is going to become a core competency for us, we need an underlying backbone, an integration hub, if you will, that powers all the applications that our internal development teams need to produce for the outside world. So this power of becoming a digitally native or a digitally driven organization is driving uh, massive innovation in the integration segment and providing a wide range of capabilities on architectures that are disaggregating as on their path towards cloud native structures here. And this is where WSO2 plays. We are the largest open source integration vendor. We are the vendor that is investing for the most on towards the microservices architecture. And we're going to talk about what we're doing in that regard here. Our growth has been pretty substantial. Uh, you may not be aware of our size, but I talked about the number of employees that we have. Over the past year, we acquired 120 customers. Um, in the first half of this year, we actually acquired 77. Uh, it's a tremendous growth rate for us. Uh, we now have done over 2,000 projects uh, on WSO2 technology with our customers, and we added about a trillion transactions that are running through our various technology stacks. There are roughly 60 million people who use our identity server to authenticate and get authorized on various systems around the world. We have 20,000 APIs that are API manager powers, and we touch more than 200,000 organizations. And over the 14 years that we've been in business, we now have more than a million open source contributions that have come in with us. And on top of that, in the past year, we've crossed over to profitability and cash flow positiveness, and it gives us a very rich platform on what to look at the future. And so as a result of that, we've started to think in 10 and 20 year horizons. Along those lines, when you start to cross over into profitability, you can start making bigger bets. You can start making bigger commitments, and you can be a little bit more disruptive into the industry that you started. Now, we already started this. Earlier this year, we announced 10-year long-term support. We're one of the few vendors that offers this. If you stay on subscription with us, we will continue to support the version that you're on for up to 10 years into the future. It's a big bet for us, but we're that confident in our technology, and we recognize that many of the projects that you are working on take 7 to 12 years of sustainability, and so we're going to be with you side by side. Three years ago, our founder, Sanjeeva, began working on a new programming language. We started small, and we started adding resources to it over the years. And we're going to talk more about Ballerina, and we've got a whole event dedicated to it. But if you've ever worked on programming languages, they take three to five years to incubate, another three to eight years to, uh, to gain market acceptance. 
so that you don't go into a programming language without a massive 10 to 20 year horizon if you want it to achieve mainstream adoption. And we've made that commitment here. So two commitments that show our long-term horizon and our long-term standing. But even beyond that, we're thinking about an even bigger mission for all of you. And what would that be? Well, we started by taking a look at the 2,000 projects that we've worked on over the years. We started with just a couple of customers in 2005 and 2006, and now we're adding them at a much more significant rate. And when we studied our customers, we came across some really interesting data. Now, when we started in 2005, the average release cycle in between releases for integration projects with us was about seven months. And this time dropped dramatically to about 2011, where we got to about 2.2 months. And over the past five years, it stayed and plateaued in and around two months, whereas this year we're averaging about 1.7 months. So a dramatic improvement. We have improved the agility of our customers. But when you look around and you look at this data, I don't think anybody who says releasing every 1.7 months is agile. So we've improved the agility, but our customers are not yet agile. So is this consistent? And so we started digging around, and guess what? The 12th annual State of Agile report, which just came out a couple of months ago, 75% of all organizations report practicing some form of agile technique, but only 4% of them report getting any market adaptive benefits from their agile efforts. Very small percentage. And even more so, Forrester, which is the organization that's going to be, that represents the next speaker after me, John Reimer, they do a study with 3,000 developers every year in the enterprise segment, and their results are even more striking. Over the past five years, our results have reversed. 13% of applications were releasing once a week or more five years ago, and now it's down to nine. It's held plateau. So all this effort, all this talk that we put into agility, and we're not seeing that benefit, what's going on? Well, we think that integration has a place here. So let's take a look at what is going on in a typical modern day integration environment. Now first, you might start with app development teams. And these app development teams individually practice agile philosophy. They are agile themselves. But what does it take for them to get into release? Those development teams are building software probably for some sort of middleware system. That middleware system may be represented by a team that represents a center of excellence, a specialty team, a specialization team. And there may be more than one of those. And these teams provide technology for scaling, but they also generate requirements for governance and change control which creates a series of gates that the development team needs to work within in order to release their software. And those systems and teams work with their operations counterparts to establish the infrastructure and also work through the governance requirements and change control requirements of the operations as well. A very classic layered architecture here. And we're going to label this a monolith architecture here. And this is a valid architecture that we have worked on hundreds of times over the years. It is scalable. It provides a centralized form of change control and governance. There is clear rules of separation between what the application development team does, the center of excellence, and the operations team. This is considered a best practice. But if you're focused on agility, there are some limitations that come from this. On a people basis, the center of excellence creates gates. These gates cause a trickle-down effect. And so while we don't like to think of ourselves as waterfall, what we're doing is we have a fast waterfall methodology that's at play that is inherently imposed by the technology and the processes that we've got. So it's an interesting consequence. And the middleware itself, even though it provides a bunch of technology services to the applications, Middleware ends up being a massive technology dependency, much the way that you have a Maven library 
maybe uh, uh, some sort of NPM module, whatever that may be, your middleware is a massive dependency that has to be versioned, maintained, controlled. So, if you want to become agile, you have to address these fundamental issues of people, process, and technology. And I mentioned that we're on a bigger mission here, and we realize that just providing integration technology so that you can run more transactions is not enough. We want to give you integration technology that lets you be as agile as you want to be, including continuous agility with integration. If you want to, we are going to be a vendor that will help you get to daily releases or even hourly releases of your integration technology so that you can become as digitally driven as you want to be. Now, how are we going to do that? We call this integration agile. You'll see this term used frequently throughout the week here. Uh, it's going to penetrate our offerings. It's going to penetrate our mindset. And it's a combination of people, process, and technology. Now, first, we're introducing the WSO2 maturity model for agility. The first thing we all have to do is to understand where do we exist on this maturity model because every organization has a different goal for agility. Right? And we need to self-identify and self-assess where we want to be for the types of or, uh, applications that we're building and the organization that we're developing. The second is, is that once you've identified where you want to be, we can help you move to the right and become more agile with a new WSO2 methodology for agility. And that methodology uh, recommends best practices for modern day architectures for which we call the WSO2 reference architecture for agility as well. So we're introducing these three offerings, a Sanka, who's out of our CTO office, is going to have a deep dive session on these offerings tomorrow afternoon. Paul, our CTO, in his keynote after John this morning is going to talk about the, 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 the theory that goes into this. Now, what's interesting about architecture is that your choice of architecture creates an upper limit, an upper limit, a ceiling on the type of agility that you can have. Now, there is no such thing as an invalid architecture. All these architectures are perfectly valid if that is the sort of organization that you're looking to build. They're all scalable. They are all offer the right forms of change control and governance. But depending upon your agility goals, you may need to evolve your architecture to support new and modern concepts. Now, we've been working with our customers on layered architectures and segmented architectures, but we're also introducing today a new type of architecture that we call a cell-based reference architecture. And a cell-based reference architecture is a form or a fundamental unit of the composable enterprise that allows a dev team to be self-organizing, to produce a unit of functionality that is completely self-contained, independently deployable, and continuously iterative and improvable. It is something that can scale on its own, it can deploy on its own, it can be modified on its own. And then cells can be composed together by different development teams to create your overall enterprise services there. So these cells start to transition away from the center of excellence, and instead of having middleware, those cells embed the necessary middleware capabilities as part of their microservices within their control plane. And those microservices and the cell itself is deployed on a new form of orchestration that is powered by Kubernetes or Cloud Foundry or even your own infrastructure that's there with an embedded event-based hybrid integration platform. And what happens here is that now your development teams can be self-organizing around the construction of these cells. They can be independently deployable. And they can continuously evolve in a very well-structured organization. And instead of having centralized change control and governance, you have decentralized change control and governance, all running on this new form of what we call a composable enterprise 
with cloud-native architecture. This shift is not for everyone, right? But this shift, if you apply it in the right way, you can get dramatic, iterative uh, improvements and become much more adaptive to the market. We talked about Ballerina as a programming language that we have invested in. That programming language is special purpose designed to make it as simple as possible to create these cells and to create the microservices inside of them. It eliminates a lot of the scaffolding and overhead that other general purpose programming languages provide that get in the way of working within a networked environment where your service is going to run within a unit of architecture. We have a number of sessions this week that talk about both styles of architecture. Uh, we're excited about all of them, and we're going to be a vendor that supports both equally well. So, this ties us back to our products. We have been known as a technology company, and we have our standard four open source product pillars. We will continue to invest in these. We are award-winning. These runtimes now power six trillion transactions a year. They're a fundamental part of everything that we do. We now provide prescriptive guidance on how you can develop, reuse, run, and manage your integrations. And then collectively with the maturity model, the methodology, and the architecture, all of this together comes together in what we call the WSO2 Integration Agile Platform. We're announcing this platform today. There's a bunch of materials available on our website where you can learn about this. This platform contains numerous components. Now, we talk about our products in those four pillars, but underlying those four pillars are all the technologies that you need to develop, design, establish collaboration and reuse, run, and manage a variety of different systems for whatever architecture you may want. Just last week, we were also announcing our Q2 release. We release our platform on a quarterly basis. This quarter's release is all geared towards microservices. There are dozens of capabilities that have gone into the evolution of our platform to make it ready to run on Kubernetes or other container-based environments. But more importantly, we're now introducing a micro ESB that has dramatically uh, fast boot time that you can run in uh, uh, different container environments. And we're also introducing a micro gateway and the micro gateway offers you the ability to do uh, change control and policy enforcement on a per API basis. So that each API, if you want, can have its own dedicated gateway or a collection of APIs. And that pairs well with a classic API gateway system, which is a hybrid system for managing your overall organization. We mentioned Ballerina as a programming language. It is a compiled type safe concurrent programming language. We have had a lot of early traction. We're super excited about BallerinaCon on Wednesday. Uh, uh, at last count, we're right around 500 people between online and in presence for that conference. Everyone here is invited to participate in that conference as well. But with Ballerina, it's designed to help you build those microservices but we're advancing it in such a way where the Ballerina language will create entire cells. The cells will have its own gateway embedded. The cells will have their own data store, their own control plane. And so just in the process of writing with that language, you can create these cells and ready for deployment. So it's a big investment area for us. We get questions all the time for those people who are early interest. What's the status of Ballerina? We did our first experimental release at the beginning of 2017. Earlier this year, we declared the releases uh, starting with um, uh, 950 that it's production ready. And we've actually had customers take it into production. And we actually have a Fortune 500 customer who will become referenceable later this year who's using it to rewrite a massive cloud system that gets millions of transactions a day with it. We plan to get to 1.0 language stability, which will offer backwards compatibility by the end of this year. And we expect to have about 50 production customers using it uh, by the end of this year as well. If you want to explore this, we are giving early access development support. There's a no-risk adoption 
We'll provide unlimited development query time for you and your dev teams. Uh, we'll offer whatever fixes that are nef necessary. And our only ask in exchange is that you provide some referenceability. So talk to your account manager. If this is interesting to you, we can help you get engaged or participate in the conference. Also today, and in partnership with a company called Chasm from the founders of Apache OpenWhisk, we're announcing an implementation of our stack focused on serverless. And so developers can write functions. They provide the code. And with those functions, they can create applications on an event-driven architecture. What makes our serverless solution unique is that we provision the entire environment. It is a private function environment with your own resources dedicated with your own policies for how those functions will be spun up. And you can run this on any cloud environment that you want, so it's freedom from cloud lock-in. So we're offering this in an early access basis. We have a session on this tomorrow. Um, I recommend that you see that. Uh, it's pretty exciting work that they've done. And we are incorporating not just Ballerina as a fundamental part of this function environment, but other programming languages as well. So if serverless is something that your teams have started to research, we have an implementation that you should take a look at. All right, moving off to the product and into the business, uh, we, we have some updates that are uh, very compelling here. Now, we've talked about 10-year long-term support, and we've also introduced evaluation subscriptions for those who are new. Uh, but we've got some other programs that we're introducing. First, we've got a technical account manager program. If you want a named individual from us dedicated to your account, we can now provide this either on-site or remote. Uh, this person will st you know, uh, be immersed into your account. They will have the context of all the issues, and you can build that relationship with them over time. The second thing, and this has been uh, a huge demand for us, we're introducing what we call a platform license. But the platform license is really a way to now purchase our subscriptions using containers, uh, I'm sorry, core, sorry cores, um, as the counting metric instead of VMs. So if you are deploying a lot of containers um, and, and it's been difficult for you to count on a VM basis, uh, we have the platform license and, and you can go and count uh, by cores and use any of our products in that regard. And then also for our uh, WSO2 update manager, we are now introducing a new channel where you can get updates that only have our security patches, and we uh, eliminate all the other uh, feature functionality patches out of that channel so you can just stream for your operations team the security update. You, know, you may not have been aware, but we're opening two offices this year. Uh, one is in Australia. We opened up Sydney. Uh, we're also opening up a Berlin office later this fall. And in partnership with Chakra, uh, Chakra is opening up a local presence office in Mexico with us. Uh, I think it's imminent now. Uh, and we're going to be able to provide local language resources, local language sales, um, uh, and, and direct uh, selling capability in Mexico to complement our Latin America operations. And then we've been working very hard. Uh, John Saylor, who's with us, uh, he's, he's here. He runs our partner programs. We've been working very hard to revamp all of our partner programs. Our channel programs, which are give incentives for collaborating on new customers together, has been revamped to introduce a number of tiers to offer a lot more benefits and to make it easier for any kind of partner to get involved with us without having first making a commitment to us. That's one. And the second, and this has been a huge amount of work, particularly with our legal team, we're introducing today a reseller program. It's a global reseller program. Partners can now sell WSO2 on our behalf. You can go direct to customers as a reseller, um, offer your own terms and conditions, build up your own annuity revenue stream by getting a, a piece of uh, the shared subscription revenues that we can share together. Uh, this is something that's been in huge demand. It's taken us a long time to get it together. When resellers sell our subscriptions, WSO2 will still honor our SLA, and we'll provide the direct support relationship to the end user, no matter who sells it in that regard. So we've worked through all those details, and we're excited to put that out. Uh, we actually have a partner day 
on Wednesday, going on at the same time as BallerinaCon. And during that partner day, we're going to outline all these channel programs, the partner programs, and if you're a partner in the audience, how you can get involved with that. So we have a big week. We've made a lot of announcements here. Um, as you think about your week, one, uh, the keynotes are just spectacular speakers here. Uh, John's going to come up next. He's got uh, an amazing presentation. Uh, he's just got so much depth of experience that you want to listen to. Paul is going to come up uh, after the break. He's our CTO. Uh, he is a PhD. He, you know, kind of has that mad scientist, aw shucks, grandfather thing going on. And so he, he really does. I don't have that kind of sense of humor, but Paul, Paul definitely does. Uh, and he's going to be telling, teaching us about uh, cellular biology. You don't want to miss that. Uh, BallerinaCon, uh, it, it could be standing room only, so we're particularly excited about that. Lots of customers. Thank you to our customers who come here and give case studies. So many times when I go out into the field, people just come up to me and say, we have so many case studies. It's miraculous, and that brings in a lot of new business for us. So it's amazing that you're here. Uh, we've got tons of our engineers giving technology tracks. They're great. And we're going to have some parties each night, Monday night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night as well. So I want to thank you for listening to me today. Uh, it's all these activities that are going on. It's all of you that is making integration hot again. It's making integration sexy again. And so we're very happy to be here. Now, it's my pleasure. I get to introduce John Reimer from Forrester. He's up next. And he's going to tell us about integration as a new app platform this morning. So thank you all.